uh, most, mainly doing um, what's called gravitational microlensing, where they're measuring the brightness of stars that have been picked up by survey telescopes of showing a characteristic increase in brightness that indicates that two stars are temporarily coming into near perfect alignment so the foreground star acts as a gravitational lens brightens up the background and they monitor that change in brightness over time and it's doing that it's possible to detect the exoplanets so that's one of the main activities that happen here at QMU and at um, Farm Cove Observatory. And the other thing is, you know, as mentioned before, a chance to win the Harry Williams Trophy if you've got a really good image and you want to submit it to the competition. Entries are open right now for the 2022 competition. Okay, yeah, just a bit of history of it. Obviously, photography had to be invented first, um, but one of the, one of the um, early pioneers of this was a guy called Henry Draper. He was a medical doctor. And he was the first person, as far as is known, to succeed in photographing a nebula. And of course this was with the old style uh, chemical emulsion type of um, plate. And um, he also um, did photography of stellar spectra. Uh, spectra of stars had been discovered, but there was no way of really recording it. You could look at it with your eye, you might be able to take measurements perhaps. But Using photography, you could um, make a permanent or near permanent record of the um, spectra of stars. And so that was really the beginning of astrophysics because the spectra of the star reveals chemical um, elements that are within the star. You can work out the star's temperature and that kind of thing. Um, Henry Draper himself, if, you, if you've ever come across a star catalogue called the HD catalogue, it's named after him. Um, it was that the catalogue wasn't done by him, it was the Harvard Astrophysical Observatory. But his um, um, widow actually financed that, the production of that catalogue, so it's named in, in his honour. He died at quite a young age, and, but he was particularly wealthy, so um, a guy called Pickering at Harvard hired a um, number of women who become famous in their own right, like Annie Junk Cannon, Wilhelmina Fleming, and Henrietta Leavitt. Leavitt actually studied stars in the Magellanic Cloud and discovered the um, distance and um, relationship with Cepheid variables. He was able to do that because obviously all the stars in the Magellanic Clouds are roughly the same distance, whereas stars in the Milky Way, it's, and especially in those days, they didn't really have much idea how far away they were. So all of a sudden you had a method of measuring um, huge distances through the galaxy. So um, obviously there was continual improvement of chemical emulsions and film and so on. But of course that's all history now. Pretty much all photography now is done with some kind of digital cam uh, uh, sensor camera. Um, CMOS or CCD, two different technologies that are used for it. CCD it's still favoured for definitely professional observatories or scientific work because it, it has a known linear relationship between um, brightness of the uh, object you're recording and the signal coming out of it. Whereas CMOS is a little bit more tricky, although it's improving all the time. Right, um, there's different methods of doing astrophotography with lenses and cameras. There's the first one there's called afocal projection. There's prime focus, negative lens projection, and eyepiece projection. So, you know, oh, that's a bit strange. What it, what's this all about? So, I've got a diagram that kind of explains what's going on. The one at the top, um, that is afocal. So, what's happening here is you've got a telescope with an eyepiece that you would look through, and then you get your cell phone out stick the cell phone camera up to the eyepiece. Very difficult to hold the thing steady. Um, but you can get brackets and things that uh, solve that problem. So you're basically having a, a telescope with an eyepiece, a camera with its own lens, and using that combination to get an image. So, um, yeah, people do that all the time, whether they go up to the Zeiss, get their 
um, cell phone out and try to get a picture of a planet. As long as you can hold the camera steadily and in the right spot, it, it works quite well. Eyepiece projection is we take away the camera lens and we just have the film or the sensor. Um, so you're basically using a combination of the telescope optics and eyepiece um, to form the image. Um, that eyepiece projection is often used if you want to, if you were, sorry, your telescope doesn't have a real long focal length, but you need to get high magnification for something like a planet. So um, you use, can use this combination to basically increase the apparent size of the, of the planet. Um, and then generally deep sky stuff will always use the prime focus method. Um, all of the big observatories and telescopes use this where you just have a camera with no lens and the objective. In fact, a normal camera with a lens is, is operating at prime focus. So when you're just taking snaps or whatever on the cell phone or camera, um, that's a prime focus um, example. Um, there's also what's called negative lens projection, or sometimes called Barlow pro projection. Basically, you just use a Barlow lens, and again, the purpose of it is to increase the apparent focal length, and again, for things like planetary imaging, we want as long a focal, effective focal length as possible. So, what can you use camera-wise? Well, that's sort of started off anything really. Um, um, consumer point and shoot cell phone, as I said, they're a bit tricky to use unless you've got some way to hold them in alignment with the telescope optics. But of course, if you're doing wide field, um, you don't need anything else for the camera and the lens, probably a short focal length lens. Astrophotography, a good quality lens is really good because star images will show up every defect in the optics. So if you have a wide angle lens, um, look in the corners of the stars at the pinpoint, it's going to be easily noticed. So um, you want um, a lens that's really, um, unfortunately those type of lenses tend to be more expensive. And a, and a shot you do of a landscape, it doesn't matter if the image is slightly blurry in the corners, nobody's really going to notice. But with, with stars, you, you, it will really stand out. So um, DSLR or mirrorless cameras you attach to a telescope using what's called a T-ring adapter. I think T stands for Tamron because it was a standard that they used. So you take every camera manufacturer has their own type of mount and some of them have more than one. So you have to get a T-ring adapter for that particular type of mount for that brand. So for Canon, you have the, I think it's EF um, mounts for the older DSLRs. The modern mirrorless cameras, they have RF. I think Sony only have um, mirrorless, so there's probably no confusion with Sony. And Nikon, they will have mirrorless and non-mirrorless type mount as well. So you just buy the one for your camera. They're, they're quite cheap. It attaches um, to your camera just like a, a lens would but then it has a thread and you can screw various attachments um, that will allow you to put the camera into the focuser with whatever spacing you need. So um, other type of cameras, webcams are actually, actually make quite good um, planetary cameras um, because they have small pixel size um, they're quite good for high resolution where there's a bright object in, involved so you don't need to take long exposures. In fact, for imaging the moon or the planets, you actually want to take really, really short exposures. The reason is that if you look for an eyepiece, you see stars twinkling and jiggling around when you crank up the magnification. Um, if you take a long exposure, that will smear the image. So what they do for this kind of imaging is take really short exposures and try to just freeze an instant of where the atmosphere is steady. In fact, what they do is take hundreds of images, like in the movie format, reject all the bad frames and combine them. That's how a lot of planetary imaging is done. Um, there are also um, dedicated astrophotography cameras. These can have either CCD or CMOS. Um, they're often, but not always, monochrome. 
and I'll explain a bit about that. Um, in other words, if you want to get colour out of them, you have to use a combination of filters. Um, but they do have, um, particularly with CMOS, you can get colour astrophotography dedicated cameras. And they will often have built-in cooling, and I'll explain the reason for that. Okay, just the uh, schematic of how they work, it's not going into any real technical detail because the CCD and CMOS are actually different. But basically your photon of light comes into the chip um, and it uh, causes an electron to be released and it gets stored in some kind of storage well. Um, eventually the storage well, depending on the tech, will fill up and at that point you're fully, uh, you can't expose anymore because you either throw the electrons away or they start bleeding into the adjacent um, cells. Um, the other thing, that, that's um, a thing known as blooming, if you basically overexpose the image. Uh, the other thing is that um, the size of these things can change a lot, but they're typically measured in microns. But planetary cameras, you want a very small one, um, pixels on the uh, chip because you want as much detail as possible but generally because you're actually gathering less light on a small pixel they're not so good for deep sky. In fact a lot of these cameras have a thing called binning where to get an image more quickly you actually combine several pixels like two by two to get four pixels uh, to acquire the image more rapidly at, at the expense of resolution. So um, actually all of these um, sensors are really just monochrome, they don't, they have a, a different, slightly different frequency response to different colours, but it's um, just this chip itself will not give you a colour image, it's basically just intensity. So if um, you want a colour camera, what they do is they have an arrangement called a Bayer filter, there's some different versions of this, but this is the basic idea, they have a basically a mask over the entire chip um, with a repeating pattern of, of filters, in this case uh, red, green, blue. And so one pixel will be um, um, imaging green, another one red, blue, and then the processing um, basically creates a colour image out of that. But another issue with this is that you're losing resolution by doing this because obviously you're dedicating certain pixels to red, certain to green, certain to blue. So, um, yeah, generally um, for research purposes you would remove the filter, get the um, luminance, which is what you're interested in, just the, you know, and if you really need colour you can use different filters to filter out whatever wavelengths you don't want to record or whether you do want to record. Um, the micro lensing, they use a particular filter. What, what, what do they use, Tim? You have a standard filter you use for photometry. Oh, there's a variety of filters, but from the site here, they often use uh, a 12 retin filter. Right. Um, so, and that's just to get. It's kind of a blue blocker. Right. Uh, to try and reduce some of the scattered light pollution from the urban environment. Okay. Yeah, you can actually buy um, special filters that try to block out the sodium lines um, because obviously there's a lot of high pressure sodium lighting around cities but it's gradually been replaced with LEDs so those filters will eventually become pretty much useless. Okay, so this, this is an example of how you do it with a monochrome camera. You put one of these, on the, um, combine one of these with your camera and you load filters, um, of whatever filters you like, into a wheel like that and it has a drive mechanism and you can just tell the computer to change whatever filter you're wanting to do for your imaging run. Okay, the um, problem with digital cameras, in the old days with film, they used to have a problem called reciprocity failure and what that meant is that when you expose the film right in the shutter it starts to expose and, uh, and dim light, the image gradually builds up. But after a while, it sort of tails off. So it starts off linear and then it 
um, you sort of get diminishing returns, I guess you could say, and that, that's called reciprocity failure, and film did suffer from that. So if you exposed for 30 minutes, you wouldn't get twice as much light recorded as a 15 minute exposure. And so um, this, there's a similar but different problem with digital uh, sensors. They are generally are linear, but they also, as well as the image that you're wanting to capture, they also have thermal noise. So, and that happens linearly with time. So if you um, have one minute exposure, after two minutes you have double the noise being recorded. And that's just because of the heat. Um, causing electrons to jiggle around and um, unfortunately they accumulate and the sensor will measure those. So um, you can counteract this to some degree by cooling the camera and that's why dedicated astro cameras will often have a built-in refrigeration and the idea is you run the camera at a standard known temperature and then because the, the, the noise or the dark current is it sometimes builds up in a, a linear fashion, you can actually, it, it is noise, so it isn't, it's not an exact quantity, it has got a jitter in it, but you can actually work out the average um, noise over time and use a thing called a dark frame or a, a master dark frame that basically tells you how much of this noise is accumulated per whatever your exposure time is. And so you can use that to subtract the noise out of your images. So um, there's also a thing called readout noise. So what readout noise is when the uh, chip has um, built up the image and you and now finish your exposure, you have to download the, the picture if you like. Um, that actual process introduces some noise as well, but it's yeah, it is a little bit random, but it's fairly low value. And there's also an offset that the manufacturer build in to make sure you don't ever get negative values. And so um, they, um, there's always a, a fairly low count coming out of the pixels. And so you can measure that by taking an exposure with a uh, really short exposure with no light being allowed onto the chip take the fastest possible exposure and that will measure the readout noise. When you actually look at it, it just looks black. <laughs> so, um, I, um, I just quickly mentioned the term ISO. That refers to International Standards Organisation. and It referred to um, actual film, where you could go and buy ISO 400 or some earlier it was called ASA 400 or 100 film that tells you how sensitive the film is to light. Um, generally, the uh, more sensitive ones, like 400 or 800, they will be a bit grainier looking results. Um, so you get the best um, images with a low ISO film, but it wouldn't work too well in dim light. So um, with, they sort of transferred this concept over to digital cameras, but really on digital cameras, it's just a rough equivalence because what they're doing here is actually amplifying the signal. So when you um, take a digital picture, you can often with a DSLR or mirror scan, you can, it will often do it automatically, but you can put it in manual and say, I want a 6400 ISO. What it's really doing is just increasing the gain. The chip doesn't change the way the chip actually works. So that in itself will build up noise by doing that amplification. But the very newest ones have what they call ISO invariance, where that gain, applied gain is linear over quite a long range, and these cameras are getting better and better. If you get some of the latest um, cameras, you can get them going to 12,000 ISO or more, and they still have quite acceptable noise levels in the images. Whereas 10 years ago, um, that would be sort of the top you could go to and they'd be quite noisy pictures. But um, generally for astrophotography, unless for some reason you need to use a high ISO number on the camera, you want to avoid it, better to take a longer exposure. Um, so the other next thing is that's the cameras, a bit about the 
optics and telescopes, the uh, combinations you can use. The next thing is the, um, you have to actually mount the camera or telescope on something. So handheld, maybe. Um, you could possibly do a, um, a skyscape handheld. A lot of um, cameras have got quite good image stabilisation built into them these days. But because you're using long exposures, generally for astrophotography, other than planetary or lunar or solar, um, where you're imaging really bright objects, you're going to have to be taking long exposures, so handheld isn't really going to work for that. So you can just stick the camera on a tripod, and this is um, fine for a couple of things for star uh, skyscapes. Um, if you're not tracking the sky, the stars will streak. But some people um, allow this to happen deliberately. You may have seen what are called star trail images. So you have a fixed camera and you say set the exposure to three minutes. And over that time the stars are going to move in the field. But what you do is you take, um, I don't know, several hours worth of these, these software, join them together and you get a nice star trail showing the um, apparent motion of the stars around the celestial poles. Some of those are quite effective and some competitions have been won doing that. Um, the software that will do the stacking without trying to align the images, so um, that's what you need to do. In the old days with a film camera you could just leave the, the uh, lens open and let it, let it go, but the trouble is with a digital camera if you try to do that, um, if you try to take a two hour exposure it would just be all noise. So um, if you want to try and follow the motion, apparent motion of the sky, you need a tra some kind of tracking. You can track an alt azimuth, if you're not sure what that is, azimuth is just um, compass bearing, altitude is, is your um, um, yeah, uh, height above the horizon. So you can get um, mounts that will do that, will track an alt azimuth as it's called. The problem is you get an effect called field rotation, so alt azimuth tracking helps, but eventually the stars will actually streak inside the image, you'll get a rotation like that inside the image. Um, I've got a, um, a little slide here that explains why that happens. But uh, if you're going to take really long exposures and you want to remove all of these effects, you have to use an equatorial mount, which means that the mount is exactly aligned with the Earth's rotation. So you can dial out the effects of the Earth's rotation. So these are a bit trickier because you have to align the mount with the pole. In an observatory it isn't a problem because you leave it set up and don't play with it once you've got it right. Um, if you're just sitting up out, out in the backyard or a remote location, unfortunately you have to do this um, at the polar alignment every time to get... Sorry? Yeah, yeah. If you took that outside, you would guarantee that it wasn't polar. <laughs> um, but you see these adjustments um, to do that if I can... Um, whoops. So, oops, I didn't mean to hit the wrong button, here we go. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Let me fix that. Is that I hope that hasn't mucked things up too much, Steve. Ah, uh, oh. oh, yeah, that was a bit too uh, yeah. I'll just have to click forward to find where we were. Oops, I need a shot. Okay, so um, polar alignment, alignment is a topic in its own right. A few people here, no doubt, have um, the, the old fashioned way of doing it was called drift alignment. Um, but it takes a while to do it, and it's pretty tedious to try and do it in the field. So there's computer assisted methods of doing it these days. Okay, for untracked imaging, I was talking about the star streaking. There's a sort of rule of thumb which is called the rule of 500. So you take the number 500, divide by the focal length of your lens, and that gives you roughly the, the um, longest exposure you can take. 
before you start to see trailing in the image. Now this applies to full frame cameras. If you've got an ASPC size chip, it will happen earlier because you generally, um, those chips are cropped in and so you've zoomed into a small bit of sky so you'll notice the trailing a bit earlier. So you might have to, um, if you do this calculation, um, you might have to, uh, if you've got one of those cameras, maybe divide by three quarters or two thirds or something to approximate how long you can get away with it. As I said, if you're doing star trails, you don't worry about it. Just take as long as exposure as you can get away with. Okay, well, this here is trying to illustrate field rotation. Uh, unfortunately, the darkness isn't the same in each image, but earlier in the evening, you've got the constellation of Leo rising, and you've noticed the angle that it's at. And then a few hours later, uh, I think you can see it here in the middle. Um, it's actually, it has actually rotated. So if you're tracking an alt altitude in azimuth and you've got Leo within the field of view of your telescope or camera, it will actually appear that the whole constellation is rotating in the image. And in fact, if we go to the last one, you see it's now tilted the other way. Um, I don't want to bamboozle everyone, but there's actually a formula that calculates the rate of rotation. Um, and um, it's, there's an observer's constant, as it's called, which depends on where you are on the Earth uh, in terms of latitude, and there's the rate of the Earth's rotation involved, and then you, um, um, you use that formula, the, that constant times the cosine of the azimuth divided by the cosine of the altitude gives you the rate of field rotation per degrees per hour. You think, oh, that's your vegetarian. You never have to worry about it. You either don't do it and use a equatorial mount, or um, it is possible to get a device that automatically does this called a D rotator. And this attaches to your focuser and actually turns the whole camera to counteract this rotation using this formula. So that's the way all the big observatories actually work because they all have all has enough mounts like the big Keck telescopes um, because it's not practical to put one of those on an equatorial mount, it's just too difficult engineering wise. So they um, have the sensor um, mounted on a D rotator that counteracts this problem. And I believe you can get them from for amateur setups as well, but um, it's just something else to go wrong, so you probably better off to sort of an equatorial mount. Another um, issue you're going to run into is focusing. So if it's a DSLR or mirrorless camera, you'll usually have a live view that you can see what the camera is doing. So you select something bright so it's easy to see a bright star. And then you'll, you should have a facility where you can actually magnify the image. Um, maybe five or ten times. You magnify the image as high as you can go and you then manually adjust the focus until the star is as point-like as you can get it. And once you're happy with it, you basically leave, leave it there. If you try to do um, automatic focusing on the sky, you, it's <laughs> really going to work. Um, not with any camera I've ever tried anyway. So you have to do manual focusing. So if you've got a lens with an auto manual switch, you photographing the sky, turn it on to manual. And there's some aids that you can do that, uh, use to do this. Um, there's a thing called a Hartman, or there's also a baton of mask, which seems to be more popular. And if you've got software that's recording what you're imaging, you can use a method called FWHM, which means full width, half maximum. And I'll just, um, this is what a batonov mask looks like. It's a really strange looking thing. Um, there are patterns for these published on the internet for different size telescopes um, or lenses, and you can print them out and make one yourself probably, or maybe if you've got a 3D printer, you could do that. <laughs> 
And it looks really odd, so how, how do they work? This is what happens is you look for a telescope with a bat light of Mars and run it through focus. So your telescope is focused when those spikes are exactly crossing through the centre. I can't freeze this unfortunately, but if you just watch. Now, so that's what basically what you're looking at through the eyepiece. Um, and you look to get those spikes perfectly um, centered like that and then you know you've got a really good focus. Otherwise you just do it by eyeball on a magnified light view screen. Um, you um, can get um, programs that will allow you to remote control digital cameras. Definitely Canon and Nikons, I'm not sure what's available for Sony. There's a program called Backyard EOS and you basically use the um, USB port on your camera, plug it into your computer and this program, it's not free one unfortunately, but it's pretty reasonably priced allows you to take control of the camera from the computer and you can name it at a star and it will actually um, do this calculation for you looking at the, the focused image of a, star, a bright star and you adjust the focus until it tells you, it'll actually tell you what the WHM value is and you basically tweak it to get it to a minimum. So um, those computer aids can help with focusing as well. Um, so um, tips for DSLRs, and this applies to mirrorless cameras as well. Um, shoot RAW and JPEG because the most information is actually in the raw files, but JPEG is quite good to have a quick check of what, what the camera thought it was imaging. Um, raw files, you have to process in some kind of raw processing software, whereas JPG files, you just basically view them. As mentioned earlier, lower ISO, generally lower noise, but longer exposure. So you can play around with your camera depending on how linear it is through the uh, IS, lower part of the ISO range. And with DSLRs which have a mirror, um, it's a good idea to have the mirror lock up if the camera lets you do that. And the reason is if you take a long exposure and the mirror goes flipping up, it can actually induce a little bit of vibration. So um, you obviously don't have this problem if it's a mirrorless camera. But you can get around the mirror. Um, another thing is um, you're pr pressing the button to do um, the exposure and it causes the same problem. So you can get a cable release or if you've got a computer control on the camera as well you don't have a problem. And a lot of, um, a lot of cameras have got built-in timer delays so you can press the button but set it to wait 10 seconds before taking the exposure. That way any shape that you introduce into the camera and tripod will die out. And I, I found um, I've got a Canon 70D and I quite enjoy having the articulating display on it because you can you can position the display at a convenient angle. Whereas if, if it's just one with a screen on the back you have to if it's up aiming up at the sky it's pretty tricky to even kneel down or bend over to see what's what you're uh, viewing. Okay, so a little bit about post-processing. Um, often what you'll do to get really deep images, instead of just taking one image, you take multiple images, and each image will have a certain amount of information on in it. And what the stacking software does, it aligns all the images, because they may not be pointing at exactly the same bit of sky, they could be slightly rotated or anything like that. The software will align the images, and then there are different stacking options. A popular one is what's called median stacking. And the process of stacking helps to um, increase the signal to noise ratio. And um, yeah, any, any of the really good deep sky images will be stacked. And there's free software to do this. There's a thing called Deep Sky Stack. It's Stacker, there's Cyril. Registack 6 and Auto Stack at 2. I think the last two tend to be better for planetary stuff. 
Um, um, Eric, do you, what do you use? Um, well, yeah, I use um, Deep Sky Stacker, Stacker, Zero, or, yeah, depends on what you're doing. So, Registacks and Auto Stackers are for um, planetary or solar stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's also a nice one called Sequoia. Oh, okay, yeah, I've seen that yes, one, yeah. Yeah, that's great for Astro Landscape. Yeah, that's free as well. Um, yeah. It allows you to um, paint out the, um, the um, ground part of your image and you can you can stack the other parts and just use one of the foreground images. It's free, which is the good thing about it as well. Um, what um, a lot of people do is often you these days for planetary stuff is use auto stack it too and to do the stacking of planetary images. But then Registat 6 has got some amazing um, noise reduction software on it. I have no idea how it works. It seems almost magical the effect that it has. It sort of breaks the, um, does some sort of tricky mathematics to uh, extract as much um, detail out of the image as possible without introducing too much noise. It's probably, um, yeah, you get, you get your stacked image of Jupiter and then put it through the, the um, that, um, part of the Registat 6 processing. I think it is probably the best one for that, for, for pulling detail out of the image. And it is real detail as well, because you compare with images you get from um, um, spacecraft like Juno and that kind of thing. Um, there's some popular non-free ones. Uh, Maxim DL is basically an all-in-one package. It has um, um, plate solving, image acquisition, stacking, the whole works, and it's what's used at the observatory here. Um, because it spits out files in a, in a way that is useful to the scientific community. So, um, yeah, the um, other one, PixInsight, um, a lot of the top astrophotographers use this one, a pretty amazing program. It's a very um, big learning curve to understand how it works. Um, just with star trails, I've mentioned that before. Um, you, know, you can't take super long exposures like you did with um, a film camera because of the dark noise or dark current. So you maybe get away with three minutes or a bit longer, maybe five minutes. And then you can use a program called Star Stacks, it's quite good for it. I think Sequitor will do this as well. But one thing I like about Star Stacks, it's got a bit of a cheat in it. And the problem is with taking lots of images, there's a slight gap between each one. And um, Star Stacks, Stacks has a setting you can say basically join up the trails. So it's a bit of a cheat, but it makes the images look a bit better. Um, generally, planets on the moon, you want, um, and particularly with planets, you want a long focal length. So often, if your telescope doesn't have a long enough focal length to get a good size image of the planet, you can use Barlow. Some people even stack Barlow, so you have two Barlows. The thing is, you've got to remember, though, when you do that kind of thing, each optical element you have is going to add a bit of scatter or um, distortion or whatever, depending on how good the quality of it is. So um, what's often done with planets actually is, is to take a movie rather than individual pictures. And so um, webcam is really good for this. You can get an ABI movie of the planet and auto stack it will process those automatically. It will It'll, it, they actually, the software inspects the image and you say, oh, 50% of the frames are pretty bad, so throw out the 50% worst frames or, or whatever percentage you, you feel like in the settings. So, um, yeah, DSLRs are usually not so good for planetary because the pixels are usually too big um, compared to webcam, so you're losing resolution. Um, I know with Canon ones, you can um, actually get back out the OS to record the live view at five times magnification, and it happens that that's exactly one for one 
crop of the central, central part of the, of the chip. So we're just basically cropping the image and, and giving you the full resolution of the central part of the image. So you can do that with backyard EOS. So um, that's quite a handy. Op and I, I use that for imaging um, Saturn and Jupiter on the Zeiss, which already has a long focal length, 6.6 .6 metres. So you didn't need to use a barlow with it to get quite, um, quite good um, resolution images of the planets. How, how do you actually connect a webcam to a telescope? Oh, um, well, you can, you can actually buy them it's already modified. But it's just basically putting it in a barrel or a holder that you can put into a focuser. Um, is anyone, uh, these days you, you get cameras which are dedicated for this purpose, planetary cams, but really they are just a glorified webcam. But uh, has anyone here tried to adapt a, a webcam for this purpose? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you can get, well, what, what did you do to mount the mount it? Oh, my okay, case, so I made up an aluminium tube with the right dimensions, an inch and a quarter. That was the size of the eyepiece and ended up gluing the um, webcam and having first taken the infrared cut filter out of the uh, out of the webcam. Oh right. So yes. it, was, it was a case of sacrificing the, the webcam, but it's a very cheap. Yeah, um, uh, doing that on a webcam was no problem. Some people do it on DSLRs, mm -hmm. but I can tell you it avoids you warnings. <laughs> oh yes. <yeah. laughs> You can also remove the Bayer filter. Um, but the reason people like to remove the IR cut filters for astrophotography is because a lot of stuff up there is emitted by what's called hydrogen alpha, which is a really deep red colour, and the IR cut filter will block some of that. So when you've got a lead nebula, you see these beautiful red colours in the nebula, and um, you see with the astro camera with just filters combined colour filters and then you put your DSLR and you get disappointed at the results because the, the red is really diminished and so some people um, will actually have the IR cut filter removed um, or um, you can actually they made the one without the IR cut filter it was a, like a, a 60A, D60A and it was for astrophotography where it was actually manufactured with the cut filter not included. Um, I don't know whether that still happens. Um, it's probably not a really big market for them. But. Yeah. The, Esther, um, the latest mirrorless series did have an eye, which is a mod pre-modified version of the USR. Okay. So they do still do that. Okay. Nikon did one as well for their DSLRs a few years ago. So um, just a little bit of optics. Um, how much detail are you going to be able to get? One, one issue is the size of the pixels. You think the smaller the pixels, the more detail you're going to be able to pick out, but the problem is you run up against physics <laughs> because of the, um, the resolution you can get out of a telescope um, depends on this formula up here. So you've got the sign of this angle and the angle is the um, the smallest angle that you can resolve on the sky and um, it seems like an arbitrary number 1.22 times the, the, the degree of lambda here is the wavelength of the light so the shorter the wavelength the smaller the um, area of sky you can image so basically means that blue light will have better resolution than red light. The other thing there is that capital D, that's the aperture size of the telescope. So in other words, the bigger the telescope is, the more resolution you've got. But on, on Earth we're limited because we get to a certain point where the atmosphere kicks in and stops us being able to resolve anymore. And that's why they put telescopes into outer space, because you can just keep putting bigger and bigger Telescopes and they'll resolve more and more and there's no worry about atmospheric problems. So what this means in practice is when you inspect the image of a star, it isn't actually a point or a disk, it actually looks like this. Um, where 
these rings around the outside are called diffraction rings and the, the blob in the centre is called the airy disc and that will basically go down to a minimum size depending on on the image plane, depending on the, the aperture of the optics. And assuming everything else, that the optics are good quality, of course. And if the optics are bad quality, <laughs> um, you're not going to get this ideal thing. So, for example, if you have two stars that are close together, then you get to a point where you can distinguish them at that point, but here you can barely distinguish them. Well, maybe you can't if there's a bit of atmospheric turbulence. So this is what um, limits how much resolution you get. And if you're using things like proper astro cameras, you'll um, have in the specs of the camera the actual physical size of the pixels. You can calculate the theoretical resolution of your telescope based on its ap aperture and whatever colour you want. And the idea is you want to have enough pixels to be able to separate the um, stars as well as possible, but having more pixels than that doesn't help you. So, and having too many pixels is just a waste of pixels. So, you can try and figure out matching the pixel size of the camera to the um, optics, the aperture of the telescope. Generally, it's not something you worry about when you're starting, but when you're um, Sort of getting more into it, then you start doing these calculations. What will be the ideal pixel size for my my telescope? Yeah, basically, if you have a heap of heap of pixels looking at one area of the area just then that's called oversampling. You're basically not getting any more information than is actually there. Um, quick thing to finish off, we have what are called calibration frames. I talked about this dark current and also um, readout noise. Um, so if you're using image processing software, you can actually account for some of this stuff. You can take what's called a bias frame. So you take a zero length exposure. I think I did mention this before, no light falling on the chip. And you, you basically take you know, a bunch of them, maybe 8 or 16, and you um, tell your software to calculate an average bias frame. And it then uses, it stores that away in a folder somewhere and remembers where it is, and it uses that for processing your images. So um, we also have what are called dark frames. So this is like a bias frame, but Again, you don't get any light onto the chip, but you make the exposure length the same length as your exposures you're going to take for your real images. And so and it's really important that also the camera is at the same temperature as it is for your real images. Um, if it's a DSLR or something, you can't really control the temperature, but over a given over night, you can sort of take an average of something, it will, it will still help um, if the temperature doesn't change too much. So you can take a series of dark frames and that's measuring the thermal noise. So if you were taking one minute of exposures, you'd take a, um, a few, maybe another dozen or two dozen or however many you can you run, dark frames. And again, these can be um, used to subtract the noise out of your real images. Sorry? Okay. I was just going to ask, realistically, if you've got a, um, um, a stack, like, let's say 16 dark frame, whatever, and you took them in um, uh, at night in summer, so let's say it's 15, 16 degrees outside. Well, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't use ones you've taken in summer as calibration frames yeah. for images you've taken in the winter. That, okay, that's what I was just going to ask. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. is this going to be enough study to bother or is this going to be a complete waste of time, or is this going to be? It may be if there's a big difference in temperature, yeah. so, uh, yeah. That's where the cool cameras are. Yeah, yeah. because you, you can run them at a set temperature, so you know what temperature the camera is running at. Right. Um, because it's got a built-in shell. You don't use automatic dark frame subtraction on your camera? Oh, yeah, yeah uh, you can do that. Um, I don't know about other cameras, but my one does have this where you can you can set it for long exposure noise reduction. 
what it actually does, you can you say take a one minute exposure, you can hear it takes two exposures, and it actually is doing this itself. It will um, automatically take a dark frame and subtract it. it do, one frame does help, but it's better to take a bunch of them to, to get the average noise rather than just one particular instance. Yeah. The other thing the dark image does, it will pick up defects on your sensor. Because if, if you get a dark frame, sometimes you get what are pixels that are stuck on, and they always read out, you know, as though they're fully exposed. So a dark frame will detect those, and they'll be there all the time in the same pixel. So the, the software can account for those. And what you do is deliberately move the image, your real images, to a slightly different position on the sky, um, maybe only two or three pixels different. So it's a really tiny difference, but it's enough to move the position of these bad pixels. So you know that if there was a star there, it isn't going to get destroyed by the bad pixel. And the software can say, oh yeah, this, this is bad in the um, dark frame, so we, we, um, we know that that's not a real thing. So I think what it does, it replaces the, the hot pixels, it's called with an average from the dark frame. So a little bit of a processing trick. And the, the other one, the last one, is what is called a flat frame. And um, basically what you do is you take a picture at a um, exposure that roughly maybe 50% saturates the image, but you don't want to overexpose it or underexpose. You want a sort of middling to good exposure. And it's basically a field that is completely, or as close as possible, to evenly illuminated. And what this does, a lot of telescopes, particularly ones with mirrors, the mirror might not be quite big enough to fully illuminate the chip that you're using for your camera. So you actually see in these frames that there can be a fall off in brightness in the corners, even though what you were photographing was perfectly even brightness, the optics is actually vignetting the image slightly. And so the flat can account for this. You can also see if there's um, issues from dust on the optics because that will cause some kind of, um, what do they call them, dust? Um, there's a term for it, what do you call it? Um, donuts. Dust donuts, yeah. It's out of focus on the film plane, on the image plane, but it will form like a donut. And the, um, the flat will record that and so it will be able to remove those from your image. Obviously it's better if your optics are clean, but <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the flat can help to remove that from your final image. And, the, and like we could um, detect hot, hot pixels with the dark frames, um, the um, flat will pick what are called pick out dead pixels. So in other words, if you take an image of an even, a nice um, twilight sky that's nicely illuminated and there's black pixels in there, then you know that that pixel is dead. And again, the processing can take account of that. Um, yes, you don't have to worry about these calibration frames to begin with, and particularly with um, wide angle shots, um, you probably don't need to worry about them too much. A couple of, uh, was it three or four years ago, we had a guy, Babak Profeshi, from the, the world at night. Um, he's famous for doing a lot of land, uh, sorry, yeah, nightscape photography. And most of his images are just a single image. He doesn't stack them. So he just tries to get it as good as possible. And he does do some pretty amazing images. So, yeah, it, it is possible, particularly with wide field images. So, um, that's all for tonight. Is there any questions? Are there any online as well? Uh, Sometimes Not people put that I just show back at the start the you have the different types of optic configurations and you show the barrow lens as opposed to using a an eyepiece projection. Yeah, what's the advantage I guess in these lenses? Uh, yeah, I I think so because a barrow is probably a simple lens in a lot of eyepieces. So maybe um, um, you also have some control with a barrow to do with I think it can operate at different 
distances from the focal plane, but I, I'm, I think it is designed for a specific magnification, so... Like you can slide it out further and get a slightly yeah. more... But I think they do have an optimum placement mm. in the design. So if the manufacturer says it's a two times bar then it's probably best to, to stick to that. Yes. Um, there's a thing that Tally you make, make called a power mate. You've probably heard of them. Which works like a barlow, but is actually a different optical design. But, okay. but they can be used for um, for this purpose as well. Okay. Um, would you only use a, a bat mask on a telescope, or would you use it on a? Um, you could actually use it on a camera lens. Oh. Is anyone, do you know anyone doing that? Uh, yep. Yeah. 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 Um, you can actually buy. Um, yeah, it's mostly for people who have difficulty focusing at night. Um, like be it eyesight or that the camera doesn't like you very well. Um, yeah. Some people actually sell really finely grated bucking off masks as a filter that can slide into the lens. Oh, yeah. um, so those exist as well. So definitely yeah. people using it. Yeah, it's for a situation with a camera lens is where the built-in autofocus of the camera um, just can't handle the low light. Um, cameras are getting better. Um, the, the newest uh, mirrorless ones can do pretty amazing things. But um, the other thing is you can just focus your high eye on the magnified light view and you'll get pretty close, but a, a baton of mass is very sensitive to getting the correct focus, so that's why people use them. And it's easy to see where the focus point is. Obviously, my gut, you couldn't stop it at that point, but um, yeah, when you're actually doing it, you can stop and do a little tweaks until you get it, get it exactly right. I don't understand the theory behind it, it's some kind of um, diffraction trickery. I don't know if there's any optics people here who might be able to explain how they work. Oh, um, next week I think is film night, right? Uh, yes, next week is film night, it'll be here, of course, and uh, there's been a lot of talk of play about a lot of the new telescopes that we've got up into outer space, which is really fantastic, but they also a lot of talk around how the whole space telescope is coming in of life. However, that's not really the case. And the documentary next week is on, uh, it's called uh, Space Exploration and the Age of the Hull. So it's really good. It's got some very interesting information around the Hull, some brilliant images that it's taken over the years. And very recently, some of the new stuff that is talking about as well. So there's the first documentary, the second documentary will be a shorter one that runs straight after it, and that one is on the cause of creation by uh, BBC Sky and the Okay, thanks, Robert. And um, remember, we wouldn't normally have anything the following week because it's the fifth Monday of the month, but um, because of us having the 20th taken off us in June, we're going to run the planetarium review of the winter night sky. So that's in two weeks time. Alright, thanks everyone.